Hello, I'm Trace Haythorne, Executive Director for the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education. Thank you for joining us for this video to explore the proposed redesign that has been accepted by the ACPE Board. Joining me today are David Carl, Chair of the Organizational Design Workgroup, which facilitated this process, Carlos Bell, current ACPE President, and Donna Dunn, our consultant for the process from Tecker International. Thank you all for joining me. To begin with, David, can you walk us through the process? How did this get started and how did we get to the proposal received by the board? Well, my best memory, Trace, is that we, uh, this all started in May of 2014 when the ACP Board of Directors um, called for the, uh, in the creation of an organizational design work group. And, um, so over the summer months, uh, members were identified and uh, we began to make connection with one another. Then in the uh, fall of 2014, we, uh, we actually had a chance to meet and uh, engage. We decided to go with some initial survey questions, uh, which we sent to the membership. We wanted to make sure this was a, an inclusive process. We got some helpful feedback, but soon learned that those were not the uh, all-inclusive questions that we needed to ask. So um, we uh, were grateful that another part of our task was to uh, begin a search for uh, a potential consultant to join us. Uh, we narrowed down a number of applicants to the two that we were most impressed with. Uh, Tecker International uh, was selected. Uh, by the board as they, um, both of these candidates were interviewed. Um, Donna has helped us get through this process, uh, to say the least. Hmm. Out of that came a more thorough uh, formal online survey in the summer of 2015 that uh, was followed by some regional meeting discussions, uh, conversations, if you will, to identify critical issues and opportunities for ACPE. Uh, pretty lively discussions when you open them up in the region, when you say trace and, uh, but each step of the process, I, I just wanna be clear, the organizational design work group was passionate about this being as transparent as possible. So each step of the process, uh, along with the synthesized data and the raw data was made available on the website uh, for those members who wanted to uh, to go there. We um, then presented uh, November 2015 to the board uh, that led to uh, some intentional reflection about purpose, uh, mission, and vision. Uh, in May of 2016, uh, wonderful meeting in Denver, uh, facilitated by Donna and Glenn Tucker. To, uh, to develop uh, a critique and frankly to redevelop uh, models. Uh, five models got identified by the larger membership out of what seemed like hundreds and um, then that got narrowed down to three which we reflected back to the, uh, to the group. The organizational design work group again took that feedback, asked for more input from the membership regarding the three models Never was that intended to be choose door number one, number two, or number three. It was more about reflecting on three different models that would give us further insight. Then the, uh, we as a group um, met to discern uh, what we heard as the wisdom of the membership and presented our model, one model, to the board in August 2016. Once we did that, we were... Um, with gratitude dismissed and uh, and with gratitude we accepted the dismissal. <laughs> Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Carlos, what are some of the features of the proposal that you find most exciting and what are the aspects of the model that resonated at least from your hearing with the board? Well, thanks, Trace. Um, I'm really excited about the proposed uh, governance. Um, the proposed bylaw changes and um, governance structure are guided by the membership. And I think that's really important that the members know it's their input and their desired outcomes for the future 
of ACPE and the organizational design work group has been work, worked towards that goal. What is it? What are the wishes of the membership? Um, if approved, the board of directors will be selected by the association and the members will be based on their competencies and not particularly cliques or I like you or I don't like you or politics or what have you, but it will be a competency-based uh, board that will be able to focus more on the vision, um, the future, and mission of ACPE. And I find that really exciting. Um, the work of the commissions or the committees, they'll be able to take care of the work they need to do, and the board will be able to do more of the visioning and direction of the future. So I'm really excited about the direction we're headed, and hopefully um, this is gonna this is gonna make us outstanding. I mean, we're gonna be dynamic with this proposed governance if it's approved by the membership. So to summarize, I'm really glad that this is a membership driven and we're looking at the desired outcomes of the membership. Thank you. Donna, how would you compare this model with other associations? What's distinctive and what helps align ACPE with best practices? Um, I, from our perspective, this has probably been the most inclusive process we've ever had. Um, most organizations, they might do a member survey, maybe two, uh, delegate a small group and off they go and present, ta-da, here's the model. And ACP has really um, been extraordinary in terms of member input, member feedback. Um, I, having been uh, within the meetings of the work design work group and listening to the conversations saying, wait a minute, our members are telling us this. Our members are telling us this. It, the, the thoughtfulness and the purposefulness, and I will say a room of 500 people at tables and, and lots of conversation and lots of uh, con debate and uh, a lot of consideration, that's an experience that very, very few groups do, but it, it's a testament to um, really being driven and being very uh, inclusive of member concerns and being really, as, uh, as everyone has said, very transparent. So it's a, it, I think it's an extraordinary model of how to, how to go through this kind of change process. In terms of best practices, um, I'm not a fan of that phrase. I'm a fan mm -hmm. of good practices and appropriate practices. Um, if there were best practices, we'd all be extraordinary all, all by ourselves. But um, in terms of what ACPE is as an educational organization and as, uh, as a member-driven organization, this model does a number of things. One, it, um, as, as Carlos has said, made things, it's really member driven. It may feel, it will feel different, but there is probably more member involvement uh, at every level and selection of, of, uh, of board members and leadership um, and member um, responsibility in terms of how work gets done uh, than you have right now. The other ex really good practice that, um, that this model sets up is one that many of us probably don't want to think about, but uh, it really sets ACP up to be accredited by other organizations beyond the Department of Education. Mm. They are, there are some very strict, strict guidelines. If you want to be an accredited educational organization by another group, such as NACA or ANSI, um, that the Department of Education doesn't even ask you to do. And this model sets you up really well to if, you, if ACPE ever decides to pursue accreditation by a different group. That's really helpful, especially as we look at international partnerships and some emerging opportunities there. Thanks. David, you've been a part of a similar process in the past. What was different about this one? Well, you know, time flies. So it was only 20 years ago that um, AMHC and the, uh, the Association of Mental Health Clergy and the College of Chaplains um, voted to merge. Uh, this all started with um, 
five presidents of five different cognate groups to include the College of Chaplains, AMHC, uh, the Association for Clinical Parental Education, the National Association of Catholic Chaplains, and the American Association of Pastoral Counselors. Five presidents met um, in person uh, for numerous times to talk about what would happen if we work together more closely, and in fact, what could we do better together than separate? Well, we came up with some wonderful ideas. Um, it turns out that when it came time to vote for several of the organizations, it um, uh, a couple of things started falling apart, and um, so it only led to two other organizations to, to merge uh, with, uh, I think, with courage, the College of Chaplains and the Association of Mental Health Clergy. Um, but in that process, uh, what was the same was it was the same anticipatory grief. Everybody was uh, needing to think about what it means to let go of egos as well as logos um, and to put aside for the betterment of our common work and for the betterment of the movement of spiritual care uh, into the future. Uh, that was necessary uh, for new life there had to be some, some death. Um, I, I see some similar things as we went through this process and still hear some um, uh, fear and trembling. Um, but the thing that made it the most different uh, for me uh, 20 years later was the technology, frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. While people and processes and react, reactions and responses were somewhat similar, the technology allowed for more input uh, from the entire membership uh, through the surveys, uh, through the, the websites. Um, all of that was uh, just made for a, uh, a more inclusive opportunity. And, um, and it was a little more simple with only one entity, uh, ACPE, although we did find some um, uh, opportunity to uh, continue to speak with some uh, uh, diverse egos and um, diverse uh, strong opinions uh, that would come from our membership. It's not that ACPE has authority issues, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think to your technology point, the fact that we're having this conversation with Donna in Boston, you in Charlotte, Carlos in Dallas and me in Atlanta, um, it just speaks to how much this terrain has changed since those 20 years have passed. Carlos, what's some of the preliminary feedback you're hearing related to, um, to the model? Well, I've heard a lot of excitement, um, a lot of energy, and the good thing about this process is that the membership has been able to share their ideals, their dreams, their fears, their hopes for ACPE. Um, I think there's some anticipatory grief, but I look at it in a positive way that anticipatory grief doesn't have to be negative. It can be energizing. It can cause some enthusiasm about what we're doing. And um, yeah, there's going to be some things that traditions that we may be letting go of, but I like to reframe it and think of we're creating a brighter future, a brighter tomorrow, and the next generation of ACPE leaders, our organization is going to be much, much more stronger, much, much more greater. And I believe the enthusiasm that we saw in Denver at the annual conference is a testimony of how hungry and how much people would desire to see creative change and to give their input into the future of our organization. So there's some naysayers here and there along the way, but overall, the synergy is great. And I'm just happy to be a part of, part of this exciting process. So it's been real positive overall what I've heard. Thanks. I'm curious, Donna, from your experience with other organizations, if um, this anticipatory grief, this grieving is something that sounds familiar to you or a similar kind of process. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's, um, as, as was mentioned, there's, there's tradition, there's history, 
there's, well, wait a minute, this is who we are, and now you're asking us to be something different. I think that's one of the big challenges is it's not different. It, it is different. It's not changing your history. It's not changing your principles and your purpose and what you're grounded in. It's changing the operational side. It's not asking you to be something other than an educational-based organization, a, a spirit-led educational-based or, organization. It's asking you to be a different structure. So the, the grief is attached in, in my experience, in our experience, to a comfort level with how things get done. And all of a sudden, things are going to get done differently. And oh, by the way, we still don't know how that exactly is going to look. So it's really scary. Um, and if there's a struggle organizations have, it's with patients. It's with members um, being willing to be patient and trust the process. Um, you know, we've, we've grown up with trust but verify. And this is a little bit of trust to trust. That, that the decisions made are the right decisions. And from our experience, I would say you've made extraordinarily good decisions. And now to trust that those same good decision-making processes will happen on the implementation side. The other thing is that there will be some mistakes along the way in the implementation side. And uh, to... Um, I will, I don't, it's hard not to frame this in light of our current political situation, but to point fingers and blame. Um, because there's almost nothing in terms of mistakes that are, that, that are going to be fatal, that are going to go, oh, it's the end. The world is, you know, the, the chicken little, the sky is falling. That's not going to happen. Is it going to be a little disruptive? Yeah, it will be, but it really will be, um, it's, a, it's the way you get it done right. It's, and most of the decisions that are made on the implementation side are going to be right. Most of them are. A few of them will be, oh, gee, we thought it was going to work this way. And ah, this is what happened. Um, we better tweak it and fix it and make it work in a different way. And, and so the struggle is more around patience and trusting the process and, and yes, there's grieving and, and letting go of the past, which has gotten you a tremendously long way. But there's nothing you do today that you did the way, I mean, 50 years ago. I, we used to rotary dial telephone calls and party lines, not video conferences. And there's nothing you do today in your regular life that you did the same way you did, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And to expect ACPE to thrive and grow without this kind of change is kind of a false expectation. Okay. Thank you. David, I'm curious, we've talked a little bit at the 30,000 foot level. What about at the street level as a supervisor? Are there some things here that you see that um, you think will be important for your practice? Yeah, kind of uh, building on um, Carlos's and Donna's uh, points, I, I'm, uh, I am excited. I, uh, I think being in healthcare, we tend to focus on the pathology and uh, that's where we start. So I, I, I don't want to sound like I am uh, preoccupied with uh, anticipatory grief as much as saying that I recognize it when I see it. Uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited and frankly relieved. Um, as a, um, someone who has administrative duties at, uh, at my shop, I'm uh, relieved to be in compliance with the federal labor laws, for example. I think that's a good thing. And... Um, I love it when some um, uh, financial liabilities get addressed and uh, get corrected and that we uh, now can be acting in a more prudent fashion. And, um, and I think we're in a better position to face the competition. In healthcare, we know about that. And if we're not being um, uh, ponying up to that, uh, particularly in this day and age when new organizations are being born, uh, administratively, I'm feeling like this new model can um, assist us to uh, posture ourselves far better. But as an ACB supervisor, um, wearing that hat as well, I've not let go of that uh, calling. Um, I like it that the national office is going to be in a better position to help me, uh, to help me do what 
I've uh, sometimes been preoccupied about. Uh, you're going to help me advocate for ACPE. Uh, the office is going to simplify my work as a supervisor because I don't need to do some of the things that's going to be automatically done now uh, at the office. And um, and I like that the, uh, the board is empowered and that we're looking to get persons on the board who can think differently than us supervisors. I think that makes nothing but good sense uh, to be relevant to um, the kinds of things that are facing us. So uh, with a, a, this board um, in a new formation, as only the implementation task force is gonna help us understand, um, I think we're on a healthier track. And so um, that said, as a ACB supervisor, as well as someone in administrative duties, uh, I'm relieved. Great, thanks. Carlos, you spoke to this a little bit from the president's perspective. What about from a supervisor's perspective? From, from a supervisor's perspective, what's really energetic, what's really creative, what's really motivating about this is that my identity as a spiritual educator is being strengthened. In no way am I losing my identity as a spiritual educator. If nothing else, it's stronger, it's more clear, and I can articulate it on the same level with my hospital administration that what you require of medical uh, physicians, what you require of social workers, nurses, other healthcare professionals, we are on par. Our governance structure, our financial structure is now on the same level as other professional organizations. And I can hold my head up high and say that the same requirements or expectations you have of other professionals, we have those same expectations for spiritual educators. And so really it's a partnering. I see this new um, structure as a partnering, as a strengthening, and that um, I guess every week as a hospital administrator, I get somebody who calls me and says, hi, Chaplain Bell, I'd like to be a chaplain. <laughs> And they have no idea of what is required to be a chaplain or someone just wants to walk off the street. I can do what you can do. I can handle and accept the responsibilities that you have. And they don't even understand the death and dying issues that we deal with, the withdrawal of life support, the code of ethics that we adhere to. All of these things are really important to who we are as spiritual educators. And I like what our, 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 our vision about transforming people's lives. You don't do that by accident. You don't do that by osmosis. You have to be skilled, you have to be trained, and you have to have some accountability to someone in order to carry out the role of a spiritual educator. So. I really see this as strengthening my identity as a spiritual educator and being able to speak intelligently to my hospital administration. Thank you. I think about how um, critical so much of that is in Dallas recently with the shootings of the police officers there and what it must have meant for your team to be able to respond. You wouldn't want someone without training jumping into a situation like that. Trust me. We had people coming off the streets from different groups or different associations saying, we would like to support you, we would like to help you, and it was good to be able to draw the line and say, no, we have HIPAA and some other standards that prevent us from just allowing someone to come in off the street and providing care. And that's a good example, Trace, thanks. Yeah. Donna, you mentioned implementation a minute ago. Um, what are some of the important considerations ACP needs to pay attention to if we pass this model, looking at probably not having this fully implemented until the end of December 17? I go back to the patient's word, um, but I think there, there are a couple of things that come along. There's some things that will happen very quickly and by necessity. There are some things that will take longer. There's some, a transition period. Um, 
I think it's important to remember that all that information and all the data and all the, the, the feelings and opinions expressed to the organizational design work group is there for the use of the implementation team. So where people are very concerned uh, about losing relationships, um, changing boundaries, I have an issue with boundaries, as many people will tell you, um, but that, that it's important that the implementation team, everybody understand that the implementation team is gonna use some of that same research to make sure that the implementation meets the needs that people expressed. And uh, it's not that, okay, we did this research on design and we get to chop that off and forget it and do something else. That it, it comes along as part of the process. So that sense of the relationships are essential, however we get them done, that's really critical for the implementation team to keep in mind and build, help create structures and opportunities. Um, I think that's, that's one of the big things for everyone to keep in mind, that, that the listening done by the design work group is it doesn't go away that the, that it continues to influence the implementation piece of it so i think that's that's one of the key pieces um the other piece is that the changes are not there there may seem like a whole lot of changes and then it seems like nothing happens and then there'll be some more it's a matter of some things need to change because for legal issues or other issues some things um need to change but will take time to get the implementation right and then there are the things that will imp that maybe get implemented and go uh there was an unintended consequence to that one and we need to go back and revisit it and so that um it's easy to say trust the process it's much more difficult to actually trust the process uh but that's the other uh, important piece that people have to keep in mind is it that, that there isn't going to be anyone involved in this. There isn't anyone involved in ACPE who would intentionally do anything to harm the organization, ever, ever. And that all of the work of the design work group, of the board, of the implementation team is to make this uh, a better organization, a stronger organization, a more competitive organization, an organization designed for the next 25 to 50 years and that, that the intent is always for the best actions for ACPE and its members. That's great, thank you. David, some folks have raised concerns about the loss of regional governance and in thinking both in the anticipatory grief piece as well as um, some of that trust the process piece. Uh, there have been some pretty intense responses to that. How would you respond to those concerns? Well, I think building off of Donna's comments, uh, it's what we as an organizational design work group needed to keep in mind. We have to trust that the uh, implementation task force is going to attend to uh, uh, to much, if not all of that, in dialogue with the uh, with the membership. Um, I'm reminded that the uh, Chinese character for crisis has two faces to it. One face is danger, the other one's opportunity. So again, that we are having these concerns raised is not a surprise. In fact, it's, uh, it's good to have them raised so that we can, uh, we can all talk about it. But I, 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 I have found that while we, as a design work group, uh, held the dangers and uh, engaged each other about that, we, we came away feeling like there was, um, this is really an opportunity, this, this new, way of uh, uh, drawing boundaries is an opportunity to uh, simplify governance um, by relegating much of it to ACP office. I uh, want to thank you on the front end for all of what you'll be taking on. Um, it allows some uh, focus, I think some more focus on matters like accreditation, certification, professional development, which we we're all passionate about. Um, I think most of the uh, certification commission work is going to be done on a more local level. And I think that's going to lead to some cost savings. Uh, but certainly we don't need a, a 35 member certification commission meeting twice a year and trying to figure out how to hold all those different types of um, enterprises. Um, 
you can already tell I, it was hard work for me not to stay out of implementation uh, language as I was chairing the design piece. But I think the implementation committee was going to address the specifics of how uh, regents will uh, transition more into uh, educational uh, and program oriented local communities of practice. Uh, again, getting back to our passion, getting back to our identities of who we are as, as educators. Um, as we proposed, as Don has intimated, it doesn't have to be decided to be an announcement, but it's as we work it through with the implementation task force, those three administrators are gonna be um, hired to um, uh, increase the uh, activities of the, of the region and to uh, attend to all of the, uh, the different uh, things that are gonna get created, co-created, and um, what we really got excited about was visualizing uh, local communities of specialized practices so that uh, now, we're, now we're getting together for purpose, uh, the purpose of, of maybe um, uh, those of us who do supervision in children's hospitals, maybe a specialized practice within that, uh, that area, those of us who are administrators as well as CPE supervisors might have a uh, specialized interest in talking through how do you weigh the uh, the pros and cons of all of that. So, um, so I think attending to geographic geography and attending to uh, some of the demographics that our research has has found over the last number of uh, years, um, and at the same time paying attention to relationships. Uh, with each other while we increase our expertise in what we're doing. Um, I think those are the opportunities that come with this, uh, this new shaping. Carlos, can you say a little bit more about those communities of practice? That's another place where people have asked some questions about what are these and what are you thinking? Mm. Okay. Um, I'm going to take off, well, I'm going to integrate rather my ACPE president hat and my history as a member of the certification commission, because that's where I spent the majority of my career um, on certification. And one of the really important points was theory and practice. And so the theory that undergirds the community of practice is from a book. It's called Situated Learning, Legitimate Peripheral Participation. And that's kind of the theory that undergirds the community of practice. So the theoretical construct, though, was it involves participation in a way of learning, of both absorbing and being absorbed in a culture of practice. And that's kind of the theory, the theoretical construct behind the whole um, community of practices. How do we absorb? How do we become part of a community? And where it breaks down, where the theory breaks down is what David was alluding to. When we lose relationship, when we lose community, when we lose connection, that's where the theory of uh, community of practice is going to break down for us. However, if we continue to maintain and build on the organic communities of practice, such as supervisory education consultation meetings, and those times that we spend together, as well as gathering together to foster a new sense of being, a new sense of program delivery, we're going to be okay. And I think of it as um, sometimes uh, Aaron Beck in cognitive therapy. He would say. Instead of looking at it as a problem, how do you reframe the problem and look at it differently in a more constructive, productive way? So you got my theory hats, my CPE certification theory wheels turning here. But how do you take the theory and look at it differently and not, it's not as Donna was saying, all gloom and doom and the sky's falling, but if we really look at this theoretically and concretely think about how do we implement this and build upon the connections and the relationships, and that's the one thing I heard membership saying, 
We want to maintain our community. We want to maintain relationships. One of the struggles with the current struggle with the current structure is many times millennials or people who are moving into a new region, they'll say, there's no place for me. Or you wait your turn. I've been here for so long and your turn is coming, but just wait and learn the ropes. Well, I think sometimes we're losing out on some bright ideals and some creativity and some energy that could really move our beloved organization further. So I, I, I think of it as we're not limited by geographic boundaries, but we're, be, we're able to just dream and we'll have a financial structure in place, the implementation work group, if this is passed, they'll be working on how do we make this work? How do we make this a win-win for everyone? And no one, I hope no one thinks that they're going to lose their identity or their purpose, but they'll be stronger and able to do things much more um, create creatively. So I hope I articulated my theory well enough to... <laughs> I think this, sub humor to this. this subcommittee is ready to approve you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Donnie, we were talking earlier about these external accrediting bodies. Can you say a little bit more about those and especially <laughs> relates to that international piece I mentioned? Yeah, there are two very strong ones and there are a couple of others. There, they are, um, they accredit a lot of different areas and one of the one probably most familiar to everyone is ANSI, which has to do with standards integration. Um, but one of the things they, that one of their components is uh, accrediting and certifying educational bodies. And ANSI in particular, uh, if you are an educational organization accredited by ANSI, it, it is, respected in many countries around the world. Um, other, other government, governmental agencies in particular go, oh, we know ANSI. And if you're accredited by ANSI as an educational organization, um, you're, it's not saying it's easy to work overseas, uh, but it is easier to be um, recomm uh, both recommended and recognized as a strong and viable and um, valuable educational partner, uh, particularly for foreign governments. There are some, uh, most of the very large uh, educational organizations are, are accredited by ANSI. NACA is another one. Um, but what it says is not only do you have certain standards for your education, but those organizations require you to have certain standards for your governance mm -hmm. so that you are well governed mm -hmm. and that your financial situation is, is well in hand through good governance. And uh, they, those organizations um, that your, uh, your educational processes and in particular your testing is protected because of the way your governance is structured. And that you can't have entities all over the place doing their own thing, that it is centrally coordinated. So when you're particularly moving into on the international front, those other accreditation bodies that are recognized internationally can help you with your relationships in particularly moving into new, new areas. That's helpful. You know, we've received word from the Department of Education that we can do programs in other countries, they just wouldn't recognize them. So ANSI then would become the recognizing body of those programs, um, but could also serve as a recognition part of what we do here in the U.S. as well. Absolutely. When you meet ANSI standards, um, it says you you have, uh, I, HIPAA is the wrong phrase, but you have certain boundary, you have created systems that protect the integrity of your program, that protect mm -hmm. the integrity of your testing, that your testing is uniform, that it's applied consistently, um, and, and that the governance um, uh, doesn't, that, that the governance pr keeps those protections in place. So where the Department of Education, you can be structured kind of however you want, um, ANSI is not going to let you do that. And this, the proposed model is one that will very closely with some tweaks fit 
some ANSI or NACA accreditation requirements. That's great. And thinking of governance, David, um, one of the new features of this is the Leadership Development Committee. Uh, some folks have asked if it's just a replacement for rank or if it's something more than that. Can you talk a little bit about that piece? Yeah, I think it's a little bit more than that. I think the, um, so this uh, seven member uh, standing committee of uh, the board uh, is going to meet four times a year. It's um, uh, similarities uh, with rank is that it, it, it is nominating persons uh, to serve on the board. Um, it will, uh, the rotation seemingly uh, of the nominations, the terms and the like um, sounded a little bit confusing as some persons read it as I was listening, but bottom line, we're just trying to make sure that it's a staggered uh, uh, service terms so that uh, everybody doesn't leave at the same time and come at the same time. So uh, again, I trust the implementation task force uh, to pan that one out and, uh, and make that all the more clear. Um, so this, this group's gonna annually solicit nominations um, I think uh, we built into it uh, the idea that let's make sure that those who serve on this leadership development committee uh, are also rotating uh, every every five years at least and um, so that we get new blood and new ideas as Carlos was mentioning this uh, the creativity in our organization is um, uh, is not age specific it's uh, it, it we just need to continue to generate the, uh, the wisdom uh, from different places and spaces. Um, it's going to, um, it's also going to be uh, taking into account new competencies that there's going to be required for board membership. And I think that is, um, so the leadership development committee is going to be uh, held accountable uh, for what it needs to be doing. It's uh, feels like a little up and ante. So, Board membership is no longer hopefully going to be, well, nobody else is going to do it. Let's get Bill or Sally to do it. I mean, I hope there's no Bill or Sally. I'm calling out on the board now, but I'm just saying let's, let's not get, <laughs> get somebody who um, uh, has time and uh, because nobody else is uh, willing uh, to do the service like uh, sometimes happens with organizations. Uh, the thing I'm really excited about is this uh, leadership development committee is going to initiate and provide direction uh, to leadership development. And uh, this may tie back into the, uh, what would be the uh, exciting ramifications for our, our geographical areas that the, uh, uh, the leadership development committee might be um, offering uh, ideas about programs and education that would, uh, would spark that and, and uh, build up on the relationship uh, dynamic that uh, that we all need for our well-being. So, um, so some of the old, but a good bit of new. And uh, I think that's about. If others have comment on that, I'm I'm very open to hearing. That's helpful. Thank you. And one of the other concern areas that folks have raised is that the new model doesn't have a standards committee. Carlos, can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd encourage the membership to um, to reframe the thinking on the standards uh, committee, that the work of standards has not come to an end, but the membership is redefined with a new name and with more clarity, the purpose and function of the standards committee. And to maybe move away from black or white thinking that it's all or nothing, but this really is another creative way with input, and I want to really emphasize input from the membership of how we think standards can function in the future. And one of the things that I believe standards can do, um, they can lay the groundwork, I think. One of the responsibilities will be the level one, level two curriculum. And how can we make that more uniform, unified and more objective to where we're more on the same page and, let there, and yet there's some creativity for everyone. 
how do we how do we adhere how do we adhere to a level of standards that all of the members can say yes i understand this or i buy into this and use it more as a road map for us doing our work and less than a punitive or a must do um sledgehammer if you will i think that's how some people have interpreted standards in the past and i believe if we open up our mind and look at it as more of a road map it's going to make our governance model our bylaws and everything we do as as has been alluded to much more creative and position us for the future we won't have a lot of that red tape <coughs> that you have to deal with in order to get something done. People will be able to get their work done more efficiently and feel better about it. Um, it's not Thank a you. dot your I, cross your T type thing. So That's helpful. I think one of the other things that I've heard as feedback, you know, the, the <coughs> credit commission never receives a standard from standards welcomely if they haven't asked for it. Right. Um, similar for certification and that often certification and accreditation are thinking of ways to write standards and passing them back to standards. And they feel at this point that they are nothing more than wordsmiths. Um, and that doesn't feel like an effective use of their time. So yeah, part of what I'm hearing a hope out there would be is that we actually find ways of using those good folks from standards in other areas and that we really ask the commissions to be responsible for, the generating of those standards and the board then serves as the gatekeeper. Yes. Um, let me uh, ask just a couple more questions and we'll wrap up. Now, Donna, with your unique purview of this work, what do you think success, lo success looks like when ACPE has completed this process? Oh, ask me an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I granted I'm I, I'm involved, but I'm not involved, and so I have an interesting perspective. And I find this an incredibly exciting time for ACPE. I I, I occasionally work with organizations where um, it's not quite this exciting. I've got a couple right now I do, and ACPE is one where I think um, approval and ad adaptation, adapting this, adopting boy. It's early. Adopting the uh, this this proposal presents tremendous opportunity. It's it presents. I think what for governance and policy wonks in, on associations like I am, what I see is unbelievable flexibility. Um, if the leadership, if the board is at the st strategy, future, direction setting level and delegating off to committees and task forces and work groups the flexibility to do a lot of different things, to address issues as soon as they come up, um, to creatively look at what you currently do and say, what more should we be doing? One of the things I heard during the design work group meetings was, we don't do anything with our alumni. You know, and, and I happen to personally know one, <laughs> one alumnus, and her comment is, I'd love to stay connected, but there's nothing for me. So the opportunity to expand and build a cohort of folks who have been through the program, who aren't going to be supervisors, but who are out there as practitioners, I think is extraordinary. Just think of the, the, the branding, if you will, of your educational process out to the world to say, you know, I went through this rigorous program, and that's why I'm as good at what I do it as I am. I, I, I find that incredibly exciting. So in terms of success, it, there's the, the, the success of implementation, of getting uh, the board on board and keeping the board working at their level and being actively delegating um, responsibilities and authority to other groups. I think there's a success would look like something along with the conversation around communities of practice of not just meeting in geographic areas, but saying, gee, um, 
I, I practice in a healthcare setting or I practice in a prison setting or I have a whole group of folks I educated who are now hospice chaplains. What, how can I help them and support them in continuing education? To me, the, the success is getting the fundamentals in place and then watching it grow because I think that's what you've got available to you is tremendous growth and expansion and expansion of, um, of influence in the community. I think there's a tremendous possibility of expansion of influence because, quite frankly, people say, oh, yeah, we know ACPE. And it may not be, wow, with ACPE is doing this cool stuff. It's just we know ACPE. And now the, the opportunity comes to be that wow, wow factor in a, as an organization. Thanks. David, how would you respond to that question? Well, I, I think it's um – as I see uh, success, it would be uh, around the, uh, the being more efficient and effective um, uh, functioning of administrative and business methods. I've already uh, alluded to that. Uh, I think success has to do with um, uh, having money. Uh, Sister Mercy once said, no money, no mission. So the financial savings that will come about as a result of this I think uh, will allow us to be more prudent and thus uh, have opportunity for uh, creativity in other places and spaces. I think success is going to be a um, heightened attention to research. I think um, being one of those places, uh, I think we need to get all the more our voices to the table when it comes to, uh, to looking at um, and heightening person's research capabilities. Uh, maybe that's one of those level two things that uh, you were talking about, Carlos, that we might uh, start integrating there. Um, I think the um, intentional address of professional uh, well-being is uh, another important component of what our organizational design work group wanted to put forward. Uh, you know, you got to be healthy in order to bring health towards others. And um uh, if, you're, uh, if you don't have any well-being in you, what are you bringing uh, to other people? So uh, doing this practice of uh, self-care, uh, self-compassion, as we uh, um, just making sure we pay attention to that is another uh, think of, I, I think of success uh, because that will, that will spray to our patients that we're mm -hmm. caring for as well. Um, and then the, I think you mentioned it already, the strategic advocacy of ACPE um, really uh, growing, uh, expanding, and meeting what is becoming a, a growing and competitive field. Um, as much as I like to think that ACPE is uh, <clears throat> the only one uh, out there doing what we do, uh, I know better. I get people who call me and uh, talk about feeling a little bit betrayed because they took what they thought was CPE, but it was not a CPE, CPE, and getting a brand out there. I think that'll be another piece of what the success is going to look like and helping people uh, connect up to a, uh, an organization that has several accrediting bodies uh, as its roots. That's really helpful. I'm aware as of this morning, there are 16 organizations across the country that offer something that looks like CPE. So yep. defining ourselves over and against that mass, whereas in 1990, there was only one. We were the only game in town. And in the course of 25 years to have seen those many, that many players come on the field, it feels like this is a really important strategic time for ACPE as well. President Bell, I gave you the last word. What does your definition of success look like for this? Um, I, I think about the speech I gave in Denver. Mm -hmm. And in that speech, I really emphasize the power of we-ness. And to see our organization come together and carry this project through to the finish line, to me, that would be success. Um, David made mention of what happened 20 years ago and hopefully we can find some meaning and purpose in what we're doing. And together, I'm a football fan, carry this across the line and score the touchdown and celebrate what we've done come May next year. I hope we're in a position where we can celebrate at our 50th anniversary. Look at what we've done 
together. And to me, that would be really a successful and joyful moment. Spoken like a quarterback. Um, I want to say thank you to all three of you for your responses, for your leadership, and for your creativity. If members would like to respond, please send an email to acpe-redesign at acpe.edu, or you can visit the Organizational Design Discussion Board at my ACPE at the ACPE website. Thanks very much, and we look forward to seeing where this leads.